It was one of those nights. I'm Heinrich Smith. Yes, my grandpa on my mom's side is from Denmark. My grandma from my mom's side is from Italy. My grandparents on my dad's side are English. Somehow, I inherited the reclusive genes of my grandmother and have green eyes and the classic light hair that bronzes in the sun and the classic Mediterranean skin. She was from southern Italy. Everybody else in my family has dark hair and pale skin. I also enjoy Mom's tallness. She's taller than my dad. I'm taller than both of them. I'm six foot even, while most of my family is around five foot eight. That has nothing to do with tonight, or anything. What is different about me from everybody in my family is that I'm the only gay person among both family trees. That does have something to do with what is about to happen. When Las Vegas gets a storm, it's usually something blistery and awful, but it seldom lasts more than a few minutes. Tonight was worse. Most people won't believe it, but hurricanes can bother landlocked Arizona, our neighbor. The news had said that Hurricane Emma had made landfall in Baja, just below the California-Mexico border, and crossed the little strip of land and into southern Arizona. Hurricanes and tropical storms only happen every few years, but when they do, they bring a ton of wind and rain, and sometimes lightning, and they can affect weather even as far as Vegas. I don't like lightning or thunder, so I find a place as far from the windows and hide. Except tonight's hurricane. I had to work. Hurricane Emma had barely lost its strength as it detoured by the Sea of Cortez and paid us a visit. Nobody expects storms like that to affect Vegas. I mean, we're in the middle of the Mojave. But when weather gets disrupted by a storm that big, nobody likes being on the streets. Weather forecasters had underestimated the strength of the storm. It isn't much fun to ride through the wind and thunder heading home in the dark after work on your bike. I work as a cashier at DIY Warehouse, a home accessories and improvement warehouse store. Normally, it's only a pleasant half an hour ride back home. Not tonight. Hurricane Emma had been downgraded to Tropical Storm Emma but it still felt like a hurricane. Rain drenched everything, hail was mixed in it, and it felt like getting splattered with marbles. The rain drenched me in seconds, the wind gusted, almost blowing me off my bike. With a quick kick, I caught myself and kept from falling. These must be sixty miles an hour gusts, or seventy, or eighty, or ninety. Nobody should be out in this weather. I took shelter under an awning, trying to catch my breath. I wasn't just drenched. I was almost drowned. Lightning flared. The wind gusted again. I grabbed the nearest pole and hung on. Thunder tore at my soul. I nearly fell off my bike. The storm let up a second, and I sped away as fast as I could go through the lakes of water on the street. Wiping my wet hair out of my eyes, I surveyed the road ahead. More water. I'd need a jet ski to get through the next intersection. I couldn't take my usual route home. Detouring through a nearby subdivision seemed like my only way. About five minutes later, I stopped to get my bearings. God, it was dark. The streets were strange. Had I missed the turnoff? A tiny yelp whimpered nearby. I looked about, seeing nothing. Could it be a small dog? Or a child? My stomach got nervous. A kid in this mess could get hurt. I was in a subdivision about two miles from my apartment. It was dark, and the rain was beginning again. Once again, I heard the yelp, a tiny, masculine voice. Worried, I followed the sound. It repeated, but it sounded more like a very weak, Help! Was some guy trapped? I'd better hurry. Hello, I yelled. Is anybody there? The wind gusted again, blocking most of the sound. I had to brace myself to keep from falling over. Somebody need help, I yelled, scanning the darkness for any sign. 
lightning rippled through the sky, revealing that the wind had gusted strong enough to tear a heavy awning off the house across the street and over to the opposite sidewalk. A dark blob was trapped underneath. Oh no, not a blob, an elderly man. I set my bike down and ran to him. I'm here. He coughed, blood dashed from a cut on his left temple. Somebody help me, he said, as if he couldn't hear or see me. I gripped his hand so he'd know he wasn't alone, but I don't think he realized I was here. Think, Heinrich, think. I feared the old awning was too big and too heavy for one person to move. But I was alone. What choice did I have? I tried to move the awkward awning, but with the slickness of the water and the shifting mud, I couldn't get a footing to lift. My feet slipped sideways. I tried to pull the old man out, but had the same problem. Pulling my phone out, I shielded it as best as I could from the storm. I dialed 911. Thunder rumbled again, blocking all sound. I yelled into my phone, hoping I had a connection and that someone heard me. The wind blew an awning on an old man. I can't lift it off him. He's hurt, and his head is bleeding. I gave the address as best as I could, but all I heard from their response was, 45. Did they mean minutes? Did I mishear them? Had I even gotten a hold of anybody? This old guy can't be in this kind of weather for that long. My name's Heinrich. I've got to get help, I yelled to the old guy, switching my phone to flashlight mode. Lightning flared. An explosion of white and blue light ripped through the night. Was it going to hit us? I screamed and ducked, leaning over the old man as best I could. All the houses suddenly went dark, and the wind gusted again, howling like a truck with bad brakes. The lightning must have hit a transformer or a power pole. Normally, the dark doesn't scare me, but it did right now, and lightning does. Thunder cracked like a belt. I screamed, terrified, and, and cowered into a ball, still trying to protect the old man. Thunder shook the world around me. Help! I yelled. Hail and rain struck me across my back, over and over again. I screamed again. God help me. I've never been so scared. Focus, Heinrich. Focus. The old man needs me. I have to save the old man. Pull yourself together. He needs help. God! Somehow I got to my feet, crouching, and ran for the nearest house. My fist crashed into the door as hard as it could. And I screamed, Help me! There's an old guy trapped out here! Help me! A small light moved in the window. A candle? The door opened, and a man stood there, hidden in the shadows. Are you okay? he said. First impression, ruggedly handsome. Second impression, bad time for introductions. I screamed in total panic mode, Help me save the old man! The man turned, his face going a little pale, and he yelled deeper into the house, Mom, check on Grandpa. Somebody's hurt outside. I ran back into the darkness, back to my bike, back to the falling awning, back into the middle of the thunder and lightning. I didn't know if this man was following. I got to the edge of the awning and tried to lift it off the old man, but my feet slipped again. It was so wet, I couldn't get a grip. I tried again and slipped again. Help us, I yelled, trying to get a better grip. A second pair of hands joined mine, the man from the door. An older woman was next to him, and she yelled, Dad, we're here. The man and I lifted together. The awning moved a little. On three, he yelled. One, two, three. I lifted with all my strength. He lifted. Lightning lashed across the sky, and the angry thunder yelled and demanded and shouted, swearing at us with his unholy fury, never explaining why he was so angry. I screamed, terrified for me, terrified for the old man, terrified. The fear was what I needed. Screaming, the two of us pushed the heavy awning off the old man. It crashed into the road as lightning shredded the sky. The thunder yelled above us, ghastly in its power. I cowered again, gasping for breath, presenting only my back to the storm, shielding the old man until the thunder quieted down. Dad, the woman screamed, grabbing his wrist, but the old man didn't answer. Take Grandpa's right arm, the man ordered as he took the old man's left arm. The old man's leg moved wrong at the knee. Oh, no. Was it broken? Dad's unconscious, the woman yelled as rain beat all of us. I gripped the arm, helping to drag the old man back to the shelter of the porch, to the safety away from the constant pounding of the thunder and lightning and hail and the whipping of the rain. Mom, the man said, get the door, a blanket, towels, some lights, whatever. We laid the old man on the floor, 
He breathed, but it was shallow and ragged. We wrapped him in a blanket, and by that time the ambulance had arrived. The 911 lady hadn't said 45 minutes, but 4 to 5 minutes. The storm had lessened. No more thunder and lightning, only wind and rain and darkness. I could handle that. Well, the EMTs loaded the old man onto the ambulance, and the man was comforting his mother, I found my bike and rode off into the rain. And a few minutes later, I heard the sirens as the ambulance left. Once home, I dried off my bike, tossed my soaked clothes into the washer to wait for the power to come back on, and found some dry sweats. Tonight, I needed a beer, but the cupboard was empty. I satisfied myself with cold, hot chocolate. The power didn't come back on until eight the next morning. About a week later, I was riding home through the Vegas twilight heat, exhausted. The past week had been busy with tons of people coming into DIY warehouse dealing with storm damage. Most of their purchases had been lumber and windows and decorations to replace the ones that had been blown away, and a lot of plants. Honestly, helping the old man had become a footnote in the back of my mind because life has a funny way of moving on. It seemed like helping rescue the man had taken hours, but in reality, it had only taken a few minutes. The intersection light turned red, and I stopped. Storm damage around Vegas had been mostly cleaned up, though there were a few broken windows and damaged signs. An older car pulled up alongside me, and the passenger side window rolled down. Are you Heinrich? a man asked. I am, I answered. You helped my grandpa last week. Got a minute to talk, he said. I pointed to a grocery store parking lot, and once the light changed, I rode to it. The car pulled in next to me. I recognized the man that climbed out. Ruggedly handsome, but he was a lot drier than the last time I'd seen him. As he climbed out, I hopped off my bike and put down the kickstand and politely asked, How's your grandpa, and how did you know my name? The man ran his hand through his dark hair, slightly smiled, and said, You are all grandpa will talk about. Every time we visit, he asks, Have you found Heinrich? He made us promise we'd find his guardian angel so he could thank you for saving his life. But it will be a while before he comes home. Yesterday, we spoke with a social worker because the doctor recommends long-term care. Grandpa has three broken ribs and a broken knee and mild exposure. But when people are in their 80s, broken bones don't heal fast. You're looking at an old folks' home? I asked. Not exactly, the man said. More of a long-term rehabilitation center. Grandpa gets confused easy, like with the storm the other night. He honestly thought the neighbors were playing their music too loud and somehow snuck past me and Mom to go yell at them. Mom and I both have to work, but stagger our schedules as best we can so somebody can watch Grandpa. I'm sorry he was hurt, I said. Don't be. You saved him, he said. Grandpa's alive. That's the important thing. We'll figure out the rest. Good for you, I said. He nodded, gave me a pleasant smile, and said, I'm Cameron. It's just Mom and me right now, and her boyfriend stays over from time to time, and we want to say thanks. How about coming to our place for a barbecue? Whatever night is good, we'll make it work. We owe you. I thought for a moment and said, I'm off Friday at five. I can bring a couple of six-packs, or some wine if you prefer. His momentary smile was all the reward I needed, and he said, Six, then, and you don't have to bring anything. We owe you. I would bring a twelve-pack of Heineken anyway. Cameron was the kind of man I could fall for. Solidly built, strong, caring, and devoted to his family. Did he like guys? Suddenly, I couldn't wait for Friday night. Just a little before six on Friday, I rode up to Cameron's place, an older, one-level bungalow, painted a dark beige with red roof tiles, though some were now missing. They had a porch with a double-person porch swing on it, and several potted plants and yellow and green ceramic vases that the porch must have protected from the winds. 
The place had an open carport, but the two cars weren't parked underneath it. Lots of storm-damaged things were there instead. The storm had broken one of their windows, but it was boarded up. With all the damage Emma had done, it might be a while before the window got replaced. The wind had also whipped the screen door on the front porch back and forth, almost yanking it from its hinges and leaving it unable to close fully. The door had banged the wall hard enough to leave large divots. I was examining the warped door and its damaged hinges, mentally taking measurements, when Cameron came walking along the side of the house. I thought I heard something, he said. I nodded at the door. We sell replacements at DIY Warehouse, and if you buy it through me, I can get you the employee discount. I don't have to go into work tomorrow. What say we fix your door? He looked at me a little suspicious and said, What will it cost me? A door, maybe some hinges and screws, and an out to dinner, I said, doing my best to offer a winning smile. Money's kind of tight right now, he said. Copay for Grandpa's hospital stay is more than we planned on. I tried not to let my disappointment show, and only nodded. What if I made you dinner instead of taking you out to dinner, he said, and shyly bit his lip. I work at Angelo's as a line chef, slicing, dicing, and cooking meat entrees. Though I used to work desserts, I can whip up anything you want. In fact, I dare you to challenge me. But I have to stay under fifty dollars. Half that would be best. Okay, I said. Anything I want? I'll do it for our second date, if we have one, he said, a little hesitant. I barely controlled my smile as I said, that would make this our first date. How about spaghetti carbonara with the side of Italian roasted vegetables? You from Italy? Cameron asked. My grandma, and she'd make that dish all the time, I said. You don't see her much? Cameron asked. I paused a moment before saying, she lives in Italy. He chuckled and said, Spaghetti carbonara with a side of Italian roasted vegetables? That's our menu for our second date. Then we'd better make the most of our first date, I said. Was Cameron lightly flirting with me? This night could be fun. I met his mom, Annette, and her long-term boyfriend, Charlie. He had his own place, and sometimes Charlie and Annette stayed there, but they alternated weekends so Cameron could have the occasional social life. Cameron gave me the tour. A living room, separate dining room, kitchen, one bathroom, a TV room that doubled as an office, a bedroom for Cameron, one for his mother, and one for his grandpa. Out back, they had an enclosed porch and a deck where the barbecue was set up. Whatever Cameron was cooking on the barbecue smelled really good. I learned later that it was prime rib, barbecue baked beans made on the barbecue, and grilled corn on the cob. This man could cook. We pulled out the beers, enjoyed good food, and cleaned up. Then Annette and Charlie took off. I suspect since Grandpa wouldn't be around for a few weeks, they wanted some alone time. I helped with the dishes. Then we camped out on their couch in front of the TV with another couple of brewskis, binge-watching old episodes of Supernatural. You know, the series about the two Winchester brothers hunting the supernatural and getting into all kinds of trouble. And Cameron and I started talking. It was three in the morning when I roused, having to go to the bathroom. The television still played some episode, but I had no idea which one it was. Cameron had fallen asleep also, and I had unconsciously snuggled into him, his arms lightly wrapped about my shoulders. I'd wake him if I moved. It seemed natural just to lay there in his arms. If I didn't have to use the bathroom, I wouldn't have moved. Gently, I sat up. Cameron woke and groggily said, What time is it? Once I had finished my business, I found him in the dark kitchen, starting coffee. I should go, I said. I'll be back by noon to look at the door. He nodded and said, Nobody's around, so you could stay and we'll get an early start. I've got some blankets and I can make breakfast. There was nothing back at my apartment that I had to get back to. 
and staying here seemed comfortable. We cuddled next to each other, leaning against the couch for the rest of the night, and I woke again about seven, and I was laying with him. I was cuddling with him, close, big spoon to his little spoon, protecting him. Wait, I had subconsciously laid behind him and had pulled him close, in the middle of the night? Afraid to move because I'd wake him, I listened to him breathe and enjoyed our closeness. He lightly snored, his warm back pressed against my chest, my arm draped across his waist. Once again, it seemed natural, comfortable. Good thing we were dressed. It had been a long time since I'd been this close to someone, and yet we barely knew each other. Cameron gently stirred, placing a hand atop mine. His strong fingers gently rubbed the back of my hand, and he lazily said, Morning, you have the funniest hair. I lightly ran my fingers through his sleep-tossed hair, straightening it out a little, and whispered, I bet it looks just like yours. When was the last time I'd woken up next to a stranger? I'd only slept with people I'd known for a while, like my boyfriends. Cameron and I didn't do anything last night except binge-watch Supernatural episodes and accidentally fall asleep against each other. I didn't plan this, I said, moving my arm away from his waist. He held my hand, his fingers intertwined with mine, and he whispered, I don't mind. It's nice to wake up with someone. For the next fifteen minutes, or thereabouts, it might have been a little longer, we softly whispered about nothing, making the odd plans for the day, and finally we got up for breakfast. I took a quick shower while he started breakfast, and while he showered, I made measurements of the door and supplies we'd need. Why did being with Cameron feel so natural, so comfortable, like we had known each other for months or years? I assumed he was gay, or maybe bi, because he had no problem when we accidentally cuddled. Breakfast was simple, leftover steak, leftover barbecue beans, and eggs. While we were washing the dishes, and I was drying them, I did something natural, comfortable, and I can't believe I was so stupid. Will Cameron stood there with his hands in the dishwater, washing the frying pan, I didn't even think. I wrapped my arms around his waist, gently kissed the back of his neck, and whispered, Thank you for breakfast. Cameron immediately stiffened. His hands stopped washing the frying pan. The only sound came from the stream of water as it fell into the sink. And the sink was filled with dirty dishwater and the dishes we had yet to wash. It was only then that I realized what I had done. I had kissed him, a casual, gentle kiss, reserved for men who knew each other, accepted each other, loved each other. We didn't know each other, never even dated, barely knew each other's names. Had I been too forward? Was I misreading the signs? Hell, what signs? I had been so comfortable with Cameron that I had acted without thinking. He was a nice guy, and I had just destroyed any chance we had of being together. I let him go, and backed up a step. Nerves strained my voice when I said, Sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. Cameron stared out the window, set the frying pan in the dishwater, wiped his hands on a towel, took a deep breath, turned around to face me, his eyes connected with mine. His hand reached out and held mine. He stepped close. He smelled of dish soap and grilled steak. His breath smelled lightly of cinnamon. His lips were close and gently parted. He leaned in close. His kiss was a little hesitant, his eyes a little shy, his hands damp with dishwater. Something inside me felt like fireworks had just gone off. Then we relaxed into each other. 
Our kiss only lasted a few seconds. But it was the start of something that lasted a lifetime. The end. Thank you everybody for joining me. I'm Gio, and I appreciate you stopping by my channel. Please excuse the odd noises in the background. My little dog snores. If you enjoyed this and would like to listen to more stories about men falling in love, please visit my channel. By the way, I post new stories every Wednesday, so we'll see you next Wednesday. Peace.